Well, I was talking with uh, my friend Chris Williams earlier this week, and he has a second grader who had come home from school and was talking about their teaching about um, you know, smoking and alcohol and these unhealthy behaviors, must have been his health class or something, unhealthy behaviors and whatnot. And they were just having this conversation about why some people do these things and, and whatnot. And so he's explaining kind of some of this, why people, even though they're unhealthy, why they still do these things. And, and, and his son is looking back at him just like super confused. It's going like, if, if, that, if these things are so unhealthy, why do people keep doing this? And, and he responded, you know, and I've had questions along those same lines from our kids, but his, his answer was so, more, so way more honest than I've ever answered the question before. And he simply said, well, because adults are allowed to make bad decisions. That's, <laughs> that's why, right? He says he's used that answer for a variety of things before. Dad, how come I get one piece of candy, but you get two pieces of candy? Well, it's real simple, son, because adults are allowed to make bad decisions, right? I, I remember when I became an adult, right? There's a lot of steps in that adulting process, right? But I remember the first time I, I moved out from under the care of my parents and I was living on my own. For me, it was, it was when I went off to college. I went to college out of state, so they, my parents dropped me off and they leave, and then all of a sudden it's like, wow. The list of things I'm not allowed to do just got drastically shorter, right? There's nobody there to tell me what I can, can do, what I can't do, because all of a sudden now I'm adult. And the list of things I can and can't do have more to do with legal things, right, than, than what mom and dad thinks about things. Because now, it doesn't matter if it's helpful or destructive, it doesn't matter. I have the rights, right? I am now allowed to make bad decisions. You know, if I want to drive to Walmart and buy a family-sized package of oatmeal cream pies and eat them before I get back to campus, I am allowed to do that, right? And let's just be honest, it's college. That's the tip of the iceberg for the bad decisions that you're allowed to make, right? And, and that's what happens. And people go off to college. How many people's stories is that? Like, I grew up in church, and then I went to college, and then I got back to God, right? Like, because all of a sudden, we get this influx of freedom because simply adults are allowed to make bad decisions, right? There's nobody telling us otherwise. What we, what we find is that we get freedom thrown in our lap. We don't really know what to do with it, right? And uh, well, what's interesting, uh, before we get to our main text today, I'm reminded of Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, Paul is encouraging the Christians at, in Rome, in the church of Rome. And he says, he says I urge you, brothers and sisters. We, we really hear this, his heart just crying out to them. He said, I urge you, listen, you got to get this. I urge you, this is so important, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. It's an interesting metaphor, right? To offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. He doesn't say offer yourselves. He doesn't say offer your lives. He says offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. It's a, it's a picture of the Old Testament sacrificial system, right? As, as the Israelites would offer these sacrifices to God, they're, 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 they're offering to him for his pleasure, whatever he wants to do with it. It's this, this, and they offer sacrifices that are dead. They're lifeless. They don't have a will of their own any longer. And, and Paul says, this is what our relationship with God, this is what true worship really is, is to offering ourself completely and fully at his disposal. My, my life is an offering to you, God. And what it really is, it's a picture of self-denial. It's a picture of what, of what it looks like to deny yourself. Paul says, listen, I urge you. You need to understand this. I urge you, brothers and sisters in Christ, we must learn to deny ourselves as we offer ourselves to, to God. This is worship. We deny ourselves Paul's not the only one that talks like this. Jesus did too. In fact, uh, the, the gospel writers must have seen that it was quite important because Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all talk about this, this one statement that Jesus makes. Matthew chapter 16, Mark chapter 8, Luke chapter 9, they all say almost word for word, slight 
different. It's all, say almost word for word. The same thing. That's what they say. Jesus says, if anyone would come after me. So he's speaking to anybody who wants to follow Jesus. If anyone would come after me. You want to follow Jesus? You need to listen very, very carefully then. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, we, we tend to get fixated on the latter two of those statements, take up your cross and follow me, and go, what is, what is he really talking about when he says, take up your cross? And we talk a little bit about that. But I think he kind of sort of finds what he's talking about in the first statement. If you want to follow Jesus, you need to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. And he goes on to say, listen, this is what this is like. He says, if you want to save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you're willing to lose your life for my sake, if you're willing to lose your life for the sake of the gospel, if you're willing to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, if you're willing to deny the freedoms and the rights and that which you could have, if you're willing to lay it down for me, you're going to find life and the fullness of life. It's this thing about self-denial, though, that's, that's challenging. Deny yourself. We live in a culture that doesn't really value self-denial. Well, we have values. We value freedoms. We value rights, right? We, we, we value, hey, I have a right, I have a freedom to eat those Oatmeal cream pies. And nobody can tell me I can't. It's not wrong. It's not illegal. There's nobody that, that, that's going to tell me that I can't do it. I have a freedom to be able to eat those oatmeal cream pies. And I am going to exercise my right to, uh, um, to engage in that freedom, to exercise that freedom, right? We, we love our freedoms, we love our rights. And those, those are good. Those, those are good. Right? Our freedom, that, that's wonderful. We can talk a lot. And the Bible talks about Christian freedoms and our freedoms in Christ and, and all that kind of stuff. That's, that's wonderful. But sometimes I think we've elevated this idea of freedoms and our rights to the point where we miss just this really, really crucial element of the gospel. Where Jesus says, you want to come after me, you've got to deny yourself. But that's hard, right? I mean, right? That's hard. And, and frankly, we're not very good at it. Um, I'll, well, I'll speak for myself. I'm not very good at it, right? And if, if we were all, if we could all be really, really honest and we were able to step back and look at society as a whole and look at just us as a whole, and maybe it's you specifically, maybe it's not you specifically, but if you were just give a, a quick description of our society today and individuals of our society today, I, 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 th I think we could say we are, we are tired, overweight, and in debt. We are tired, we're overweight, and we're in debt. Right? Just as a whole. <laughs> Why? That's not, it's not actually three separate issues. I believe there is a common denominator that runs through this whole thing. We, we are, we're tired. Okay, this is really, really simple, but I think sometimes we need to go back to basics. There are 24 hours in one day, right? Your body needs somewhere between seven to nine hours of sleep to function at its, its prime level. Now, I know right now, already, in about a third of you, you're going, well, yeah, but not me, right? That's, that's what we all do. Like, I don't, I don't need, I can function on four hours of sleep a night. Okay, function, now that's our goal, right? Like, I can stay alive, good job, right? But no, 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 God created us to thrive in the life we, we live, not to be tired every day. So, but what we do is because we want to increase the amount of activity, so we got, I can't add hours to a day, so I, I give in the only place that I know where to give, in my sleep, my rest, I should say, not just sleep, but rest. And so, so I, I want all these activities, but there's not enough time in the day, so my, my sleep cuts, and I say it's just fine. And, and, and so we fill our day with good things. 
Oh, I got something this time, but I could sandwich something in on top of it. I don't necessarily technically have the amount of time to get there, but I'll, I'll make it work. Well, I'll just, I'll just stay up a little bit later. I'll just get up a little bit earlier. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just move all of the, the margin in my calendar completely out. And we push and we push and we push, right? So when you say, Hey, how you doing? The answer is tired or busy. We are a tired culture. Why? Because we have lost the ability to say no to ourselves. There's something good right there, and I can take it. There's no reason I can't take it. There's no reason why I shouldn't be able to engage in this activity. It's good. It's not bad. There's nothing wrong with it. It looks like fun. I want it, so I'll do it. I'll just pay the price later. We have lost the ability to say no to ourselves. We're overweight. We're one of the most overweight (coughs) countries in the world. This isn't subjective. This is for real. Why? It's because we live in a land where, where food is very, very plentiful. And we can get it whenever we want. Because we like the meal, so I'll have another plate. Why? Is it sinful to eat another plate? No, not, not, not directly. Is it? But here's the deal. This is not rocket science. It's science, not rocket science. You burn X number of calories a day, which means you are allowed to consume X number of calories or less a day or you'll gain weight. Now, I know I know there's healthy foods and unhealthy foods. I'm not talking about health. I'm just talking about baseline upon which all other healthy diet is based on. I, I love this. Like people, we overeat and they're like, ooh, kale's good for me, so I'll just eat more kale on top of what I'm already eating. That doesn't work, <laughs> right? Like you can't just add healthy foods onto your overeating and expect to lose weight. Like it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. You have X number of calories that you burn a day and you can eat that many calories or less if you would like to lose weight. Like it's not, like it's super simple, but it's super hard, <laughs> right? Because it's right in front of us. And it's being offered to us. It's not wrong. It's not wrong to have a little bit more. It's not, this cookie's not gonna kill me. I, it's not wrong. I can do it. And it's my freedom, and I want to exercise that right to gobble down a box of cookies. I can do that if I want to. I'm an adult. I'm allowed to make bad decisions. <laughs> the problem is we've lost the ability to say no to me. Our finances. We make X number of dollars. So that means we get to spend X number of dollars or less. You see a pattern here, right? right? And if we want to spend more than X, then we have to save that much this month before. But then the credit card company says, that's not true. You, you, you make X, I can let you spend four times X this month. Listen, even if they didn't take their cut, the principle is detrimental to us if, if we're not careful. Okay, I'm not just making a general, I have credit cards, I'm not saying a general statement, but I'm saying, listen, if you spend more than you make, you find yourself in big, big trouble. The problem is not credit cards. The problem is we as a culture, me as an individual, have a really hard time saying no to myself about things that I can have but probably shouldn't. Right? Is that fair to say uh, as a culture? We're tired, we're overweight, and we're in debt. Why? Because we haven't learned the art of self-denial, which is scary. Because Jesus said, if anybody wants to come after me, like that's something we should really be proficient in. If anybody would come after me, he must deny himself. Yeah, but like that's like, I mean, that's food and money and time. Like that's different. We're talking about spiritual things. You're right. If you can't even handle the material things, why would we think that you're, why would you think that you're actually handling the spiritual side? What I've learned in my life is discipline is discipline regardless of what area I apply it to. Like when I'm, when I am disciplined and I'm like working out like four or five times a week, my quiet times are better. Because I've, I've learned the practice of discipline and it just applies throughout. My finances tend to be a little bit tighter. And not tighter, but as in I, I be, I'm a little more tight with my finances. I'm, I'm, more, I'm better with them. Why? Because discipline is discipline regardless of what field you apply it to. And, and Jesus here is saying, listen, as Christians, we need to learn this. In fact, if we go back to Romans chapter 12, he says, 
So he says, offer your body as a living sacrifice. This is this idea of self-denial. And then in the next verse, in verse 2, he says, um, do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world. The world lives for self. And the reason that we struggle with self-denial is because we really like ourselves, right? Paul says in Romans, to the to Romans, he says, listen, do not conform to the pattern of this world anymore. But what? But, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to know what is God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. For, isn't that what we want? We want God's perfect will for our lives. So we need to allow the word of God to renew our mind, to create a transformation in us. That's all true. But at some point in time, we've got to be willing to offer ourselves up to God and say, God, here I am. I will deny myself and follow you. So let's get back to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 is, is where we looked last week. Run to win. What is, what is the win? Well, I want to back up. I, I mentioned that Romans, or sorry, 1 Corinthians 8, 9, and 10. They're rich, they're powerful, they really, really need to be read together. So I'm going to, I'm going to uh, give kind of a, a real brief overview of, of chapter 8 and 9 because I want, to see how, I want you to see how it feeds into the text that we looked at last week. I'm going to oversimplify this for the sake of time, but in chapter 8, uh, Paul is addressing a, a cultural issue of their day. Should Christians eat meat that's been sacrificed to an idol? And again, oversimplified a little bit, but he says, listen, food is food, and an idol is just wood. Like, there, there is no God but God. Food is just food. So if food is sacrificed to a piece of wood that's not a God, and it is still just food, so you're fine. Just, just eat it, right? You're fine to eat it. And some people say, okay, there's cultural issues, that's, that's where I'm going to land. He said, don't worry about it, I'm not going to worry about it. But then he goes on, that's not the point of why he was writing. The point of why he was writing is this, is he said, okay, so you've got freedom. You don't have to worry about it, you've got freedom to be able to do that, right? But here's the issue, is that some people don't walk in that freedom, and it offends them to the, the core of their belief, and, and they struggle, they're conscious, they struggle with this thing. We could go a whole message into this, but we won't. Um, Here's the deal. For the sake of your brother, would you abstain for his spiritual health? And when you're around him, just, just, just take a step back. You have the freedom to, to engage. You have freedom to eat that meat. But when you're with those who struggle with that issue, just pull back. You know, there's, there's no reason. In fact, I think the last verse of the chapter is really the crux of what it's all about. So he's, he explains all this. Yeah, you got the freedom. Go for it. Uh, but just be careful around those, the others. He says this in verse 13. Chapter 8, verse 13. Therefore... If what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause him to fall into sin. What is he saying? He's saying this. Chapter 8, this is what it's about. Paul's saying, you have freedoms in Christ. But I am willing to be a vegetarian the rest of my life. <laughs> I'm willing to, to take steps un, really unnecessary to me. I'm willing to deny myself. I'm willing to not engage in this. I'm willing to limit myself. I'm willing to let something go that I could take hold of. I'm willing to let go of a freedom for the sake of the, the spiritual strength of my brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm willing to let go of, of that. I'm willing to lay down my freedoms for the sake of the message that I proclaim. And then he goes into chapter 9. And the first 12 verses or so, he makes this case. He, he defends and makes this argument uh, for his rights. And, he, and he's not being facetious. He's not being sarcastic. He's being serious. He gives a very biblically sound defense of his rights as a preacher of the gospel. So, hey, I'm a preacher of the gospel. I'm investing or I'm, I'm pouring out into you spiritually. I deserve to be poured into physically to make sure my needs are taken care of so I can continue to do the work God has called me to. And he sets this up very, very nicely. But then he says, I'm not writing this to you so that you can give me money. Like, that's, that's not what this thing is about. In fact, this is, what he, this is why he builds the case for his rights now. In verse 12, in the middle of it, he says, we did not use this right that he just spent a few verses to defend. On the contrary, we put up with 
anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Like there were people treating me in certain ways that, that, that I had rights not to be treated like that, but I'll put up with it. I'll put up with anything because I don't want to hinder the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 18, he says, I'm preaching the gospel. I may offer it free of charge and so not make use of my rights in preaching. I'm not going to take hold of the, of the rights that I have. Verse 19, though I am free and belong to no man, though I have the right to make whatever decisions I want, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. He said, listen, I can do whatever I want to. I am a call, I'm an apostle called by God, preaching the gospel. I, I can impose my rights on you, but I'm going to lay my rights down because I know the prize that I'm fighting for. Verse 23, he says, I'm doing all of this. I'm laying down my rights. I do it for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. It is in this context now that we come to the text we looked at last week. We have freedoms in Christ, Paul says, but I lay them down freely. We have rights in Christ, but I lay them down freely. And now he comes to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, when he says, don't you know? It's in this context. Don't you know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. What we looked at in the New Living Translation last week said, run to win. I want to look at that again. What does that mean, run to win? Two weeks ago, it was the Good Life Habsie. It's a half mile race here in Lincoln. The winner ran it in just over 64 minutes. That is a sub five mile, uh, five minute mile pace for 13.1 miles. That's insane, right? That is flying. That, that's faster than I can run one mile. <laughs> that that pace. If I were to say, okay, I, I want to run, I want to run a half marathon. Okay. Uh, um, and I think, I think if I trained really hard and I set a new personal record, I think I could maybe do an eight minute mile. Like that's the best I've got. I don't even know if I could, right? That's my goal. And if I trained for months, I think I could probably hit that goal. But what if I just decided, I, you know what? Paul says run to win. So I'm going to run to win. I'm going to sign up for that race. And then the night before the race, I'm going to call up this year's winner and say, hey, can I crash on your couch tonight? Because I want to learn what you do to win, right? And the night before the race, I go to bed at the same time that he does. I get up at the same time that he does. I, I do the same like stretches and all that kind of stuff that he does. I do the same pre-race routine. I eat the same meal. And there we are. We're standing on the starting line. He and I are right next to each other. And I'm going, all right, I'm going to keep pace with you. We're, I'm going to run to win. And that, that gun goes off, and I keep pace, and I keep pace, and I run. I'm there right next to him at about a quarter mile. I'm just, I'm going. And then next thing you know, he starts pulling away, and I fall over hoping not to die. Like, <laughs> like that's how that story goes, right? So, so let me ask you this. When Paul said run to win, did he mean muster up um, the courage, rise to the challenge of the moment? Is that what he meant? When, when, he said, when he said run to win, did he mean, all right, just give it your best shot? No, I don't think so. See, we want to regularly, we want to rise to the occasion, but Paul is telling us we need to train for the occasion. Everybody knows the reason I would fall over dead is because I did not put in the work. Paul says run to win. It doesn't mean like generate just the most faith feelings and, and good vibes you can possibly get, and, and I'm just going to grit my way through it. You can't grit your way through a half marathon without training for it. If you, are, if you can, then you're just a pure freak of nature, right? <laughs> Truth is, there's some people who can, but it's because they spent years running prior, right? You can't, you can't, just, you can't just do that. And yet that's how we want to approach our Christian life sometimes. We think to win battles, it means we have to rise to the occasion. Paul's saying it's not rising to the occasion, it's training for the occasion. We've got to know what we're running for. Every day, you've got to know what you're running for. Now let's look at the language in this text. He says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Listen, I know that my Christian life isn't about out-spiritualizing you, right? 
And you know that in your Christian life, the, the goal is not to have a deeper uh, devotion or deeper prayer life or better than the person sitting next to you. We know this isn't a competitive thing, right? So we, we get that. And yet, uh, let's look at the metaphor that Paul uses. He says, all these runners run, but one gets the prize. I want you to run in such a way that you will beat everybody else. Not for in a competitive way. You ever see, like, almost all good sports movies have this scene where the team is up against un- insurmountable odds. But it, they don't necessarily just show the scene of the game, they show the scene of the training. They show the scene of it's pouring rain and they're doing push-ups in the mud, right? They, they show Rocky, like, beating the slabs of meat because he can't afford a real gym, right? You, you, you see this, this, this grit, this hard work, this I'll do whatever it takes, you see the picture in your mind of, of, of man, they're, they're getting up at, at 7 to train. We get up at 6. We're going to get up earlier. We're going to run faster. We're going to run harder. We're going to dig deeper because, man, we're winners, and that's what winners do, right? And we love that. Right? Every time we do that, I mean, it could be about, like, you know, curling or something. You'd be like, yeah, I'm going to go curling now, right? Like it, it does something in us, right? It could be a sport we've never played before, but we're ready to go. We understand it in the sports world. Or here we are, veterans. You guys get it. There's a prize. And so you, you don't just show up ready to shoot stuff. You train. And you discipline every aspect of your life. Because there's something worth fighting for. There's something worth training for. There's something worth winning for. Paul says, don't just rise to the occasion Run to win every day. And, and you see this, just in case you think I'm stretching it too far, you see this in his language. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. Verse 27, I beat my body and I make it my slave. Of that strict, t- strict training. And I was processing that this week. What does strict training mean? For a top-level athlete, for an Olympic athlete, what, is, what does strict training mean? Uh, essentially two things. Essentially two things. One, strict, ma- stri- strict training means denying myself. Right? It means denying myself of the freedoms or the rights that I could have. Maybe more specifically, denying myself or the freedoms, the rights, the privileges that most people have. You want to win a gold medal? Then you have to live a different life than the people around you. Like that just, like nobody, nobody's going to argue that, Right? You got to deny yourself. I think of, uh, you know, I think of my training growing up in athletics, but it's nothing. How, do we have any wrestlers in here? Do we have any wrestlers? Wrestlers are crazy. Like, I don't know if you've ever met one. They're crazy, right? Like, I remember in high school, it just really hit me. In high school, I had a game, a basketball game later after school, and my friend who was a wrestler, he had a wrestling meet. And so I was carbo loading, and he was eating a jello cup. Dude, I picked the right sport, right? <laughs> Those guys are nuts. They know what it means to deny themselves because they got to make weight. They know what, I mean, I think I work hard after a basketball practice. Like the whole team's laid out. Like half of them are passed out and unconscious, just like laying there in a puddle of sweat and four sweatshirts, right? Like those, those wrestlers are crazy because they know what it takes to win. So they're willing to deny themselves of what everybody else has. My friend, the wrestler, he could, he could have easily walked up and gone across the cafeteria and grabbed that slice of Da Vinci's pizza and ate it like half of all the rest of the students in school. But he didn't because he wanted to make weight because he wanted to win. So, green jello cup is lunch. Because he's willing to do whatever it takes to win. Part of strict training is self-denial. Listen, there are so many things that are acceptable for us. In fact, you you read into uh, chapter 10. Paul goes on, that same food sacrifice to idols. He he actually later says, even he just gave permission for you, later says, don't do it. It's not a good idea. But then he goes on and he says, listen, everybody says everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is constructive. The question is, what's your goal? See, that's the thing. When, when the win is health, it, when the win is just survival, when the win is just make it, then we, make whole, we are free to make bad decisions. We're adults. We're allowed to make bad decisions. 
But if our win is bigger than ourselves, in the military, when the win is bigger than you, you're protecting the freedom of, of millions. When, when, when the win in, in sports is all about is coming together and accomplishing this goal to put up more points than the other team to win the championship, you're willing to endure significant loss. You're willing to live differently. Why? Because you see what's at stake. So listen, as believers, there's a lot of things. I mean, media is a real popular one. What's okay? What's not okay? Listen, who cares? Like, it's like the... It's like the the guy on the basketball team who's got like a 30% free throw percentage, right? Which if you don't know sports, that's awful, right? Um, that's awful. And let's say he's a horrible free throw shooter. But um, after practice, all the guys are sticking around. They want to boost the team's free throw percentage. And they're like, hey, you got to stick around. We're shooting some free throws. They're like, nah, that's all right. Uh, I got, you know, I got uh, to go take a nap. And all the guys on the team are like, come on, man. You got to help me. Like, nah, coach never said it, did he? No. Okay, fine. Then I'm not going to. I mean, sometimes we take that mentality with our Christian life, like, well, God never said I had to. God never said I couldn't. Therefore, I won't and, or I will. And we're, we're asking the wrong questions. We're seeing life from an entirely wrong perspective rather than, okay, is this going to kill me? No. But is it going to aid you in a victory? No. Let's, let's, let's Hebrews 12.1. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off, he says we throw off two things. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. See, we want to pursue our Christian life going, if I can just avoid sin, then I'm going to be healthy and strong. And that's just a lie. That's like baseline stuff. Right? That's like being a professional athlete and saying, well, if I, if I just stay off like drugs and uh, don't eat a thousand calories of Krispy Kremes every single meal, then I'm going to be just fine. No, that's stupid. Right? Right, i got to throw off not just the stuff that's hurting me, but I've got to, if I know what I'm playing for, there's certain things that are going to hinder that, and i got to be willing to deal with that. So this entertainment or this activity or this hobby or this habit in my life may not be point to and say it's sinful, but is it moving me towards my goal? Is it making me stronger to accomplish that which God has put in front of me? That's the question. We looked at last week. Athletes don't ask, am I healthy? They ask, am I strong enough? Do I have what it takes? We got to know our win. We got to know what we're playing for. Because truth be told, if it's vague, if it's fuzzy, if it's a general idea of spiritual health, if it's keeping, spiritually keeping up with the Joneses, make sure I can at least have a normal conversation with church people, like that's like our goal, then we will not have what it takes when the training gets hard, right? The first part of strict training is self-denial. The second part of training is forcing myself to do what I don't want to do. Now, this is where... Um, I think it's, it's vitally important. I think we've, we've misunderstood a very, very important part of our spiritual development. Because we far too quickly, and I'm just saying church as a whole in general, right? We far too quickly cry legalism. Anytime we talk about something that we should do that I don't want to do, we just, boom, legalism. That's legalistic. I'm not going to be legalistic. I think we're seeing it wrong. Remember when you were a kid and you hated brushing your teeth and bathing? <laughs> yeah. Like my, my, my kids, like especially when they're little, you know, the older ones are figuring out a little bit, but especially when they're little, they're like, I don't want, I don't want to, I don't want to take a bath. I took one last Thursday. Right? Right? Why? Because it, it's forcing me to stop doing what I'm doing right now. And I don't want to stop doing what I'm doing right now. And I don't want to take a bath. I don't want to brush my teeth. Listen, I'm just going to tell you, praying and read the Bible is no more legalistic than brushing your teeth and taking a shower. It's not an issue of legalism. It's an issue of maturity. There are certain things that are going to aid you in this life that we have in Christ. If you don't read the Bible and if you don't spend time with Jesus in prayer, and if you don't surround yourself with brothers and sisters in Christ who are with a, with a single focus and vision to, to grow together in Christ, if you remove those things from your life, you will not grow healthy and strong. I can say it that matter-of-factly. I mean, you can survive. You can die a Christian. You can go to heaven. 
If that's what you want. But I want more than that. <laughs> you see, as I, we mature, bathing and brushing your teeth starts to feel good, doesn't it? You know, I love that tingly, fresh brush teeth feel, right? As we mature, a shower feels relaxing and good, and you just get the, oh, it just feels good, right? You know, we, we realize that, that these disciplines are good for us, and we realize that we have more friends if we do them, right? Right? <laughs> right? I mean, there's just some real obvious maturing that takes place. Listen, for some, that we, we want to cry legalism as soon as we say we should do. And I don't think it's legalistic. I think we just need to grow up a little bit. We need to mature a little bit. I'm not saying that, that it's always easy. Listen, or, and, and it's always going to be just this, this, we get to a point where it's just always a pleasure. There, there's times when, listen, I just, I don't want to deny myself. I'd rather sleep in than spend time with Jesus. But maturity says, I'm going to do it anyway. Because I've, I've got a battle to win. I've got a race to win. And so I don't, I don't want to do it but I'm going to. And these are just simple things. Life is filled with these kinds of things. It's not, am I healthy? Is this going to kill me? But rather, do I have what it takes to win? And that's why last week's message is so important. Can you clarify the win? Let me put it in another terms. Do you know why you're running? I asked a few friends I asked a few friends this week, um, just for, for examples, hey, where is an area of your life where you have, um, where you've got a goal and, you, and, you, and you've, you've, you've clarified the win? And uh, we got a few people responded to me, but I love Justin. Justin is, you want to talk about intentional living, it's on his mind all the time. He's a great resource. You want to think about what it looks like to live intentionally. Uh, he'll be the first to admit it's always a process, right? All, constantly growing, but it's, it's a, a passion of his. And so... Uh, he wrote this back, and, and I love this response of clarifying the win. Uh, some of the times our, our win is vague. Like, I want to just, like, be closer to Jesus. How, how do you know? Like, what does that look? I love, we need specific wins. And he writes this. He says, I know that the primary win for me as a husband, speaking of his relationship with wife, the primary win for me for as a husband is to encourage my wife to grow to the maximum of her God-given gifts and to be a catalyst to her deeper relationship with Christ. So it's a twofold win. That my wife would be, be able to excel in the giftings that God had given her and that she'd have a deeper walk with Jesus. That is... Awesome. He go, and he also says this. He says, listen, he says, uh, when we're in times of disagreement, it's easy to let go of my position or to hold strong to it based on the established understanding of what the win is for our relationship. It focuses me back on my wife's best interest and our growth in Christ together. What does it look like? It looks like, I'm going to use your example, Justin. It looks like I get home from work and I'm exhausted. I had a, a mentally and, and emotionally draining day. And no one in my family can even have a clue. And I know I just need to rest. I need some downtime. I need to just recoup. But I get home and quickly realize that my wife is absolutely frantically a mess. And so I say, babe, let me finish cooking. You just... You make a plate, go sit in your room, I'll take care of the kids, I'll bathe them, I'll get them ready, I'll take care of it. Because, and the reason that you can do that is not because you're just a good guy and a kiss up. <laughs> the reason that you can set your agenda down and take on hers is because you have remembered what you're playing for. She's going to burn out. Honestly, we could even do it selfishly, like she's going to burn out and I'm going to that's not going to be fun. But, but even with her in sight going, listen, that's it. Or, or maybe for you, the win is like my house is just chaos all the time. My house is just in um, strife. My win is peace in my home. So what does that do? What does that do? That pe- my, my win is peace in my home. We need, we need to pray together as a family more often. 
We, we need to pray together as a family. And, and so you gather certain times throughout the day or throughout the week, and, and, and you pray together as a family. You go, okay, that's a good start, but you know what? We, need, we realize that one of the reasons is because there's unforgiveness. There's bitterness towards one another. We need to start talking about these things that are causing this friction in our, and you begin to work through forgiveness with your family members. Why? Because you want peace in your home. Now, let's, let's flip this around. What if you say, I, you know what? I just want to be a healthy Christian, like and everything, but my wife is having a rough day, but she has no idea what kind of day I had. I just need to take this one off. Or you say, ah, you know, I need to pray with my kids more, which lasts what, like four days? If, if, if that's all that it is, it's going to be really hard to sustain because here's, if you get anything from today, this is what I want you to get. Winning is hard. Winning is super, super hard. And if it weren't, more people would be doing it. But it's hard. And we live in, in a world of quick fixes, right? I don't want to go on a diet. I just want to take a diet pill. It's the world that we live in. And so we just, we just want quick wins. It doesn't work. Winning is hard. It's always going to be hard. It's kind of supposed to be hard. So I say that, not to freak anybody out or make you feel like a failure, but just, just so you know this, like, listen, when you clarify a win, and some of you guys this last week went, went home, oh, I got a win, and you got beat up, think that you could walk in and, 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 and run a, 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 a four-minute mile pace. But it's hard. It takes discipline. It takes not just praying for the moment, but developing a lifestyle of prayer. It takes not just seeking the, the Bible for this answer, but it, see, it takes seeking his word for all of the answers before you begin to reap the full benefits of the investment. Winning is hard. And I wish it weren't, but it is. And, and, and I believe one of the reasons that we as believers, we, we set the bar too low, we set our wins too low, we confuse health with winning, which we talked about those things last night. Like, it's not just about being healthy. Let's, let's, let's find what we're striving for. Let's, let's see what God wants to do in our lives. Let's find a target and go after it. Because I believe when we set our, 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 our eyes on a target and we're willing to run to win, our behaviors align with health. Right? If, you, if your goal is health, you're going to fall short. But if your goal is bigger than yourself, your behaviors will naturally align to health. Some of us, we need to stop thinking about just our own spiritual health. Like, oh, as long as if I stop failing and if I stop doing this, then I'll, then I'll be like a, a better Christian. No, God has great things in store for you. He's got healthy relationships in store for you. He's got, he, there's people in your life who don't know Jesus, and he wants to use you to, to bring them into the fullness of life in Christ. There are people that you have broken relationships with, and he wants to restore those relationships. There, there's, there's hurts and, and, and brokenness in lives around you that God wants to use you to mend the brokenness. We need to look up from ourselves and see the prize that is ahead of us and work towards the prize, and I guarantee you, healthy behavior will follow. Winning is hard. And the other thing is adults are allowed to make bad decisions. And so we do over and over again. We're on the win. Bottom line is the same as it was last week. I hope maybe we were a little bit more robust in our understanding of what the Apostle Paul was saying. It's run to win. We want to win. We got to know what we're running for. We're going to run. We've got to know what it costs. Will we run to win? Or will we settle? The abundant life in Christ, the fullness of life in Christ, is not a life of settling, always striving but falling short of health. He's made us conquerors and victors in Jesus' name. So church, let's go win some battles. Let's go run the race. You know what? Even if we lose this one, we'll get up and we'll run faster next time. Let's run to win. God's got great things in store for us. Father, we thank you. We praise you. You're good. You're strong. You're powerful.